This is the kind of stuff that makes you fall in love with neuroscience. It is beautiful, stunning, complex and intricate. And this is just one neuron out of 80 billion neurons in each and every one of your brains. The man who drew this picture in the 19th century, the father of neuroscience, Santiago Ramón y Cajal, famously quoted that every man, if he so desires, becomes the sculptor of his own brain. How could we possibly master this complexity? My name is Nikolai. I'm a neuroscientist and I got my PhD from this place here and spent the last 10 years working on the question of mastering our brains from various angles, looking at how to make neurons, how the neurons find each other, how they connect with one another, and what happens when those connections, with those connections in diseases like neuropathic pain. And I can tell you, mastering our brains isn't an easy question. And quite paradoxically, the more we dig into this question, the more difficult it appears. And I'm not exaggerating about its complexity. If we talk about the place where neurons connect with each other, where they communicate, this place is called the synapse. And here in red circle, it's just one of those in that neuron. And if we zoom into it, this is what it looks like. It's a mesh full of proteins, each one performing its function critical for our survival. Each neuron has between 100 to 10,000 of those synapses. That makes trillions of synapses in each human brain. Those synapses, they determine who you are, how you feel, what you do, and what you're about to do. And if this doesn't look complex enough, imagine for a second that these synapses are constantly changing, even as you're listening to this talk and learning about synapses. Now, if that's the first time in your life you heard about synapses and it's never going to come up again, the connections that have just changed in your brain, they're eventually going to disappear and wither away. But if I reiterate that the place where neurons interconnect is called a synapse, that there are trillions of synapses in our brain, that it is their scale and the ability to change that largely determines who we are, I've just strengthened those connections. So, to that extent, we're able to sculpt our brains. But what happens when these connections do not function properly? When we cannot control our attention, when we cannot control how our sleep in insomnia, when we cannot relax, and then in more severe cases, when the synapses get hyperactivated, and this results in epilepsy, or they get underactivated and results in mental retardation, or when the neurons can't connect with each other to support each other, and then that results in neuronal death in diseases like dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, for example. The fact that we still don't have an adequate treatment for those diseases gives us a glimpse into how little we know about our brain, that we cannot master it let alone engineer it. What we can engineer, however, are artificial brains or artificial neural networks. There is no pretty picture and the concept is very abstract. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to represent a neuron with the palm of my hand. And you can imagine five numbers going down the, down the hand into the, into the palm where they get processed and the palm decides whether to send a number down the arm. And here there's another neuron connected to this one rather awkwardly. And uh, this strength of the connection then determines which number gets sent down here. And then if you put three of those together in a particular way, with particular strength of the connections, they can perform simple logical functions. And then you start putting more and more and more of those neurons, and they start performing more complex functions. But how is it possible to know how to connect those neurons? What strengths? should they be connected uh, at. And this is where mathematics comes in. It's just beautiful formulas comparing the output of that network to your desired output. And if it's 
far from expectations, then the formulas just change those weights and change and change until the network gives you the desired output. And hopefully, it can then go into real data and provide you meaningful outcomes. This is how learning works in artificial neural networks. And it has some success in the early days with image recognition, recognition of speech or writing. But the real breakthrough came very recently when it was possible to scale up that network and then use all the vast amount of data available for training it. And this became known as deep learning. And it had its applications in image processing that went beyond the capabilities of what we can reach, in defeating master players at a game called Go, at doing better algorithms for drug optimization, and many, many, many more applications. The list is growing. The complexity of those networks, however, is nowhere near the complexity of our brain. So at this point, you're probably wondering, how are the two concepts I've introduced so far connected? The artificial intelligence and the biological intelligence. And I will tease you with that question for a moment. Before, uh, but before I wanted to introduce a personal story. It was a conversation with me and my longtime friend, Darren. He is a diplomat and uh, an entrepreneur and a filmmaker. And um, it was around the time when I found out about Elon Musk's uh, neuroscience venture. And um, I said, Darren, you're well connected. Could you put me in touch with uh, Elon either directly or indirectly? And she said, yes. Why? I said, well, I, I want to work for him. Said, OK, but why? Well, because I have, um, you know, I, I admire this person for his great vision uh, and inspiration. And I also have a couple of ideas that I think could benefit his company. It's starting to look a little bit like a job interview. So what happened is uh, next, what happened next is not something that ever would happen to you at a job interview. He said, Nikolai, why don't you take these ideas and then build your own company? Could it be better and bigger than Elon's? Wow, that was a bold and pivotal question. I mean, yeah, sure, I have a chance. And you know, in today's world where, uh, you know, North Korea is shaking hands with America. The word impossible just loses its meaning. So we started a company, called it Brain Patch. And the idea of the company was to connect brains and AI. This was an insurmountable challenge for the two of us. So we started looking for help. And we have spoken with different people. First of all, to our common friend, uh, Professor at Sheffield University, Professor Basbek Davletov, who gave us some initial advice and uh, uh, provided us with some initial guidance, then got a financing perspective from a Cambridge-based venture capitalist, Max. Talked to one of, friends of, one of old friends of mine who is now back at Imperial doing research in deep brain non-invasive stimulation. And I think his research is so exciting, it just deserves this whole separate TED talk, Dr. Neil Grossman. Connected with Professor Steve Potter, who is an expert in uh, neural engineering and artificial intelligence. He's already given his TED talk. Um, serendipitously connected to Professor Paul Fitzgerald, who has uh, done 20 plus years of non-invasive brain stimulation. And last but not least, spoke uh, with uh, Sergey Petkevich, who was a blockchain, who is a blockchain expert, and was working on it long before Bitcoin became cool, and many, many other people. So our um, venture was starting to look a little bit like a neural network with, uh, uh, you know, those those connections. And I think um, this is what any organization should look like: uh, a network of people connected by a common desire to produce a certain output and capable of modifying those connections and that structure, this is important, if the output is far from desired. So let me explain to you how something that seemed a bold and borderline crazy idea turned into something that was starting to look like a feasible project. 
And this revolves around the idea of simultaneous recording and stimulation of the brain. So recording, you have heard in the earlier talks, is something that has been available for uh, half a century, and recently people use it for uh, using use brain waves to control um, wheelchairs, drones, virtual objects, etc. And then non-invasive brain stimulation. It's been known since uh, about a century ago when Galvani discovered electricity. People tried zapping their brains with electricity because why not? And then eventually, uh, now with the emergence of new technologies where you're able to specifically target uh, particular areas of the brain, this is now yielding a new revolution in brain stimulation. So with that ability to simultaneously stimulate and record from the brain, we're able to see the effect of that stimulation in real time. So it means that if the effect of that stimulation is far from the desired effect, we can apply learning to modify the stimulation parameters. And this is exactly the kind of task that I've just explained can be solved by artificial intelligence in real time. That optimization of stimulation for each individual, for each application, for your brains. And it might seem a little bit eerie at this stage, especially given all the negative connotations that happen with the artificial intelligence uh, in the media. But I think maybe 10, 20 years down the line, you'll be sitting there and thinking, well, what is brain without the AI? And the answer to that is simple. It's just brn. So, <laughs> at, this, at this stage, you're probably thinking, so now what? What about it? Uh, so you're able to connect brains and AI. What's the use of it? I'll give you just a teaser, a simple example. This is a recording of brain activity in uh, normal awake states. This is, by the way, my rec uh, recording from, from my brain, um, a part of the recording. And uh, basically, uh, using alternating current stimulation, we're able to change that. And, um, by, and research has shown that by optimizing that uh, current to the individual frequency of each brain, you're able to achieve a state that looks a little bit like this. And what this is, is a state of a brain in, in, uh, uh, when it's relaxed. So by doing this closed loop, non-invasive stimulation, using artificial intelligence to optimize this for your brains, you're able to achieve a result that you couldn't achieve, that sometimes it's difficult to achieve um, without the stimulation. So if this was a product, then I believe that the money should go from the consumer to the developer only once that particular state of relaxation has been reached. And this is a perfect case for the use of smart contracts that have recently emerged. It also gives you an, a, a, an opportunity to store this information of the success of the application on an immutable distributed ledger, acting a little bit like clinical trials. So that delivers a safe, effective, and trustworthy application of non-invasive brain stimulation. And this is just one use case. Currently, the uses of non-invasive brain stimulation combined with recording are limited by our understanding of what we can, what brain waves mean and what we can record from them. And this can have implications in diseases like uh, in, in uh, everyday life for relaxation, as I have mentioned. There's potential to do it for sleep, for concentration, for learning, but it also can have an effect on clinical side. There is potential for treating epilepsy. There is potential for treating Parkinson's disease with technologies that are going deeper inside the brain. Depression is already being treated with non-invasive brain stimulation. And there's even scope for investigating its effect on Alzheimer's disease. And I believe 
that by having this decentralized and democratized, we're able to take advantage of all the vast amount of knowledge from everybody on the planet. This way, delivering this platform and putting you in charge, thereby envisioning the prophecy that every man, if he so desires, can become the sculptor of his own brain. Thank you.